Thank you, Nicholas. This is an overview of what we'll be talking about through this presentation. The unique anatomy of the wrist enables it to perform its primary function, to help position the hand in space with the aid of more proximal articulations of the upper limb, such as the forearm, elbow, and shoulder. It's a unique contribution of flexibility and strength. While the wrist joint refers to everything from the distal radius to the carpometacarpal joints, we are going to focus upon the distal radius itself, with the other components being the focus of other webinars. The articulation between the distal radius and the proximal carpal bones contributes directly to movement in the sagittal and coronal planes, but it also indirectly influences movement in the mid-carpal joints. The distal radius, therefore, can be seen as the platform for all wrist movements. This is a view of the articular surface of the radius, with the dorsum of the wrist at the top of the picture. The lunate and scaphoid facets can be seen, specifically shaped to match their corresponding carpal bones. The sigmoid notch can be seen here, and this is the point of articulation for the ulna head and key to forearm rotation. This structure represents the triangular fibrocartilage complex, or TFCC, which articulates with the triquetrum as well as providing stability to the distal radial ulna joint. Also dorsally, note the bony protuberance of Lister's tubicle. On the volar side, the lip of the lunate facet, as well as the most volar prominent part of the radius, which is often termed the bony watershed. It is important to consider key soft tissues when managing fractures to the distal radius. This diagram has had various elements removed to highlight some important non-bony landmarks on the volar aspect. The median nerve runs in close proximity over the volar aspect of the wrist. Its function must be considered when assessing the original injury as well as proposed surgical interventions. Note the course of the palmocutaneous branch of the median nerve, crossing from ulna to radial as it branches proximal to the wrist joint. This is of particular importance during surgical approaches. The median nerve runs amongst the flexor tendons over the pronated quadratus muscle, seen here with its transverse fibers, which is an important surgical landmark for fixation. Distal to this muscle, you can see the short and long radiocarpal ligaments, as well as the radioscaphocapitate ligaments. These are key radiocarpal stabilizers and originate distal to the bony watershed of the distal radius. On the dorsal aspect of the radius, this picture has again had many elements removed. The superficial radial nerve fans out from the radial side of the wrist, spreading over the back of the radial digits. Particular care should be taken of this nerve when inserting percutaneous K wires or external fixator pins. Extensor pellucis longus tendon can be seen here within the third extensive palm winding around Lister's tubicle before inserting into the thumb. As much of it is surrounded by bone at this point, it is vulnerable to attritional rupture and loss of function following a distal radius fracture. Deeper still, we can see the dorsal radiocarpal ligament and the dorsal intercarpal ligament, which are key stabilizers of the wrist. In the context of fractures of the distal radius, interpretation of diagnostic radiographs is crucial to understanding which elements of the distal radius are injured, how significantly, and what their stability is likely to be. I think it's safe to say that the standard radiographs we all rely upon are the posterior anterior projection on the left and the lateral projection on the right. When it comes to assessing an injury to the distal radius, on the PA radiograph, we can evaluate the radial inclination measured from the ulnarmost edge of the articular surface to the radial styloid This angle is on average around 22 degrees. The radial height is the vertical distance from the radial styloid to the ulnarmost edge of the articular surface. On average, this height is in the region of 11 millimeters. Ulna variance is the relative length of the ulna to the radius. And this can be measured from their articular surfaces. On average, this is plus or minus two millimeters difference. On the lateral radiograph, as well as assessing the collinearity of the carpal and radial axes, we can also measure 
the volar tilt of the radius. Here, we pick out the dorsal and volar lips of the articular surface of the radius and measure that angle against the perpendicular to the axis of the radius. On average, this is 11 degrees volar tilted. All this can be summarized as the rule of 11s, as seen in this slide here. Typically, distal radius fractures are a product of rapid forceful wrist extension with axial loading. Commonly, this is a fall onto an outstretched hand or a foosh injury, but higher energy can be transmitted if the fall is from height or a fast moving vehicles involved. Needless to say, this slide shows a more typical British foosh injury than that of Malawi. The most commonly seen fracture pattern is one of dorsal displacement and angulation, shortening, radial angulation, and some form of ulnar styloid fracture. While these fractures will be talked about in more detail later on, I want to point out mechanically the amount of dorsal translation angulation becomes significant when the axis of the capitate is significantly dorsal to the axis of the radius. Therefore, defunctioning the tendons of the hand, reducing grip, and also reducing the range of movement of the wrist. For volar displaced fractures, often termed Smith's fractures, there is significant instability. This time, when the mechanical axis of the hand drifts volar, the significant force from the long flexes make ongoing displacement and drift highly likely and difficult to control with non-operative management, thus risking a mechanically compromised hand at wrist. In fracture subluxations, termed volar and dorsal Barton fractures, the collinear axis of the hand and forearm are lost. But in addition, there is significant loss of articular congruency, leading to suboptimal articular surfaces and mechanical alignment of the wrist. The chauffeur's fracture is a different variation of intra-articular fracture. It can lead to ulnar migration of the carpus if the volar radiocarpal ligaments are destabilized. These injuries are also associated with carpal fractures or intercarpal ligament injuries in the greater arc patterns. But these are outside the remit of this webinar. In lunate die punch injuries, the lunate fossa articular surface is significantly depressed, leading to intra-articular incongruity. As this articular surface is critical to load bearing through the wrist, such joint surface irregularity can rapidly lead to degenerative wrist problems. There have been a whole host of classification systems developed to apply to distal radius fracture patterns. However, they've all been shown to have questionable inter- and intra-observer reliability. It is rare for them to be used outside of the research environment, but there are a couple of aspects worth being aware of. The most practical and usable theory put forward has been the con theory by Rickley and Rickert Zoni. They divided the typical zone of injury into three columns. The radial column, encompassing the radial styloid and scaphoid fossa, the intermediate column, comprising the lunate fossa, and the ulnar column, comprising the distal ulna and TFCC. They appreciate the different forces acting upon the columns and the different methods of stabilizing them to allow for early mobilization. They placed high importance upon the intermediate column due to its greater load bearing responsibility and the fact that it articulates with the radiocarpal and distal radio ulnar joints, making its anatomic reduction a high priority. Despite what I said about classifications previously, there is a classification devised by Diego Fernandez, which is based upon the mechanism of injury that is useful as it gives an indication of the forces required for reduction and associated injuries. Therefore, it's a more practically minded classification that guides management. As you can see, the classification encompasses everything from simple collies type fractures through to fracture dislocations and high energy comminuted injuries. These are the learning objectives that I've aimed to cover in this talk. Thank you for listening.